Ken Bibberi. I'm the chairman of the board of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, and I want to thank you all for being here uh, for our last chairman's breakfast. Uh, before we get things started, I'd like to invite Felix up here from MetLife to, uh, to welcome everybody. And uh, again, as always, I want to thank him, Sunita, and their entire team for their hospitality, for having us here in this amazing space, uh, and for all they do. Um, they are tireless supporters of the chamber, and I want to give them a big round of applause and a big thanks. I want to thank Nancy. It's been a great year for us. It's, I think it's been an unbelievable year for the Chamber, New York overall, and Nancy's just been such a great supporter of our, of our business, She's a great supporter of New York. She's been an unbelievable leader of, of this organization, unbelievable uh, business uh, contributor. And if you think, about, you think about New York, you think about business overall, in the world where there's so many males for leading the business, to have a strong female leader is, uh, is really an encouragement. And, and I'm proud to, uh, to work with Nancy and know Nancy and continue to, uh, to work and know Nancy for a long time. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you to all of you. And I'm going to turn it over to Ken. Thank you. <clears throat> so on, on behalf of the board, I want to I welcome you to the exciting event that we have planned today. Uh, as many of you know, and for visitors to our breakfast today, uh, the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce has 10,000 members and subscribers. Uh, we represent the interests of the small and mid-sized businesses that make Manhattan so unique. We seek to advocate for, connect, and educate our members so they can grow their businesses, strengthen our communities, and create jobs across our city. This year we've had, has been an amazing one for the Chamber. We've grown our membership. We've pushed City Hall to reform the outdated and regressive commercial rent tax, and we've put on dynamic and innovative programs for our members. Today, we've teamed up with the Partnership for Public Service from Washington, D.C. to discuss why the business community should care about the presidential transition that's coming up in 2017. It's been a real pleasure to work with their team from the partnership. I want to thank David Eagles, John Gilbert, Samantha Donaldson, Zach Pieker for all of their help in putting today's event together. Thank you, guys. We obviously can't watch the news without hearing about the campaigns, the latest polls, who's leading in Iowa. But this morning, we're going to put the politics of the presidential campaign on hold for a moment and focus on the process that exists on how a candidate and president-elect will actually prepare to transition into office and why it is so incredibly important that the campaign start realistically thinking about this uh, obligation and duty they have as early as this spring. Unfortunately, there is no blueprint that exists today for how a new chief executive is supposed to take over the reins on day one. Imagine becoming the CEO of a new company with a workforce in excess of 2 million people and 4,000 of your top leaders resign at the exact same time. Not to mention that you have to ensure the global financial systems stay stable and that you protect our national security. Our inability to run this process as efficiently as possible hampers the beginning of any new administration at exactly the time when the new president is best positioned to implement his or her agenda. The partnership has appropriately recognized this inefficiency over the years and has created a ready to govern initiative to help the campaigns develop their own systems and processes this spring. So today's a rare opportunity for us to hear directly from insiders who have not only seen the transition process up close, but also understand what it's like to run major corporations and how we can bring the best practices from the private sector to the public sector to ensure an efficient and smooth transition of government. The three individuals that we have today are all exceptional public servants. And it's going to be a vibrant and dynamic conversation that we're going to open up to the audience to really ensure everyone gets a chance to participate. Our panel includes Jim Quigley, CEO Emeritus of Deloitte, former CEO of Deloitte. Jim also served as the lead for department and agency review for the Romney Readiness Project in 2012. Mr. Quigley is also a member of the board of directors at Wells Fargo, Hess Corporation, and Merrimack Pharmaceuticals. Gary Ginsburg is the executive vice president of corporate marketing and communications at Time Warner Incorporated, and former EVP of global marketing and corporate affairs at News Corp. Gary served in the Clinton transition in 92 and went on to serve as a White House attorney. Max Steyer is the president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service, where his Ready to Govern initiative seeks to ensure this smooth and safe transition. Max has also worked previously in leadership roles in all three branches of government. 
So please join me in welcoming our panel and look forward to the conversation. Um, let's, let's start it off uh, with, with you, Max. Let's break this down for the audience. Who actually runs a presidential transition and what's wrong with, with how we do it now? So I think you captured um, the, uh, the general overview in a really powerful way. It's the you know, most important takeover of any organization on the planet, uh, most important organization. And unlike in the private sector where you have uh, consulting firms like BCG and McKinsey and others that you know, you know, help uh, organizations do takeovers, you have an incredible <laughs> amount of tools and such. And Deloitte. And I Deloitte. Think I think Deloitte. I, meant, I forgot about Deloitte and should not have. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but it's, 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 it's phenomenally interesting that no one really has focused on transition planning. And so um, it's always been a reinventing the wheel process, mm -hmm. um, a little bit Groundhog Day-ish. And you're going to hear great stories, uh, both from Jim and Gary, about uh, prior work and other transitions. But there has really been no set expectation about who should run transitions or when. By and large, the, the political calculus has been very straightforward, and that is campaigns have been loath to actually focus on transitions uh, in the open because their first priority has always been to win. Uh, and again, you think about the sort of short term versus long term. Sure. Our notion is we've got to change that. You know, people make promises. We've got to ask questions about whether they can deliver on them. And if they can't run the government effectively, they can't deliver on them. So there really hasn't been a long history of effective transition planning. Um, we were able to pass a law in 2010 that moved the data transition support from election day to the convention, and our goal was very straightforward, and that was to provide, in essence, political cover for campaigns to begin preparing earlier, because the reality is that there's no way you can be prepared to effectively take over the government if you're only working from election day to inauguration. That's about 77 days. So our view is you have to extend the runway, you have to provide uh, political cover so that campaigns are not so worried about measuring the drapes. And the Romney folks were the first to actually have advantage of that, that, that process. So mm -hmm. a long answer to your question. The answer is there really isn't any set playbook. We're trying to create that about who runs the transition and when. Our view is it has to be a lot earlier than historically has been done. The Romney folks did it the best of anyone. And above bluntly, they didn't get to game time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they did a ton of preparation um, of, of, of incredible importance. But we, we, we still haven't seen a, a well-run transition to the end. Interesting. So you alluded to the, the measuring of the drapes. And I remember in 1992, right. uh, candidate Clinton was then running, and President Bush was out there a lot talking right. about uh, President Clinton now you know, measuring the drapes and so on. Uh, perception matters in presidential politics. And I wanted to see if maybe you and Jim could talk a little bit about both that kind of what you went through then, and also, uh, Jim, when, you, when you're framing and creating the, the readiness project, it wasn't called the transition, right? It was called, I think there was probably some specific uh, work and thinking that went behind calling it a readiness project and how you put this all together. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the perception issues and, and, and the politics behind your experiences. Well, in 1992, uh, to your point, Governor Clinton didn't really want to spend any time on the transition. He wanted to focus entirely on the electoral map, getting elected. It was a close election, although he was, you know, I think by September, it was clear that he was probably in the lead, but he didn't want to take anything for granted, so all the resources went into the campaign. To, to the point about not putting sufficient resources into the transition, we're probably the paradigm of not doing anything before the actual election. He put Mickey Canner, the campaign chair, in Little Rock to run the transition. Mickey brought three people down to Little Rock. He placed them in the campaign headquarters. Now imagine if you're a campaign worker, you're busting your hump to get elected, to get your governor elected, and there's a team over in the corner starting to plot who's going to get the jobs. It created instant tension between this small little group off in the corner and those who were trying to elect the governor. So when election day comes along, the team assembles in Little Rock the day after governor wins. Mickey goes in with his three compatriots to present the transition plan. The tension is now out in the open. Governor listens to the transition plan, says, thank you very much. I'll get back to you. Mickey Kenner leaves the room. He says, OK, we're going to scrap the entire plan that he, he put together in the last two months. We're going to form a whole new team, a whole new plan. Warren Christopher, you're in charge. Go to it. So the transition planning didn't actually begin until the day after the election, which I think is the root cause of why the Clinton campaign today is considered the model of what not to do in a transition. <laughs> Just to try to make uh, a couple of contrasts to uh, build on the points that Gary made, if there were three people in Little Rock, uh, the 
readiness team and to comment on your point with respect to just simply the optics of that to avoid the criticism of you know, Governor Romney is measuring the drapes and allowing that to find its way onto the front page. We just refused to use the word transition. And so we used the word readiness. We were getting ready. And had he been elected, we would have then done the transition that Gary was referring to. But until you're elected, you don't have a transition to do. And so we chose to just let our vocabulary be all about planning and readiness, not transition. And instead of three people in Little Rock, we had no people in Boston, but we had 500 people in Washington. And so if you think of the scale of the effort of what we did, by the time we you know, got to the convention, we were at 500. And on you know, three days after the election, had we had the privilege of winning, uh, we were going to go to 800. And we were in those 70 days. Because if you just try to think about it to just amplify a couple of points that my, Max made, how long would it take you to prepare someone to lead the largest, most complex enterprise that's ever existed in the history of the world? The largest military machine, the largest economic machine, the largest political machine. Could you pull that off? I know that some of you are monster talents, <laughs> but you know, could you pull that off in the 70 days that exist between the election day and the inauguration? And what we believed in the Romney readiness team is you can't do that in 70 days. And as a uh, advisor, as a professional services guy, as a consultant, we do lots of work helping merging companies try to have an issue free day one. And we were just simply bringing that planning, bringing that discipline, bringing that approach to try to have an awesome first 200 days in office had we had the privilege of being elected. And the only way that we were going to pull that off is we had to, quote, be ready. And that's why we use that language, uh, readiness. A couple of my colleagues on the team, they built and they actually published this book, which if, if you're really deeply interested in this process, it's, a, uh, it's on Amazon, easy to buy, but the Romney Readiness Project. And then you can just read and really get a sense of what we did. But the contrast from what Gary described was very sharp. We didn't have the privilege of executing the plan, but uh, we were ready. <laughs> and we had done all of the hard work that was necessary to get us to that point. I non-objectively believe. Excellent. So let's open it up to everybody, but let's dive into the, the actual numbers, right? So there are 4,000 political appointments that the president will make when he takes office, and about 1,100 of them, if I'm not mistaken, need to be confirmed by the Senate. And I think President Obama, when he came into office in, in, 20, in 2008, had a pretty decent transition. But then at the same time, he only had, I think, 200 of those Senate-confirmed appointees in place by August. So. Clinton only, had, Clinton, Clinton only had 50. 50. I think that was the number by, by the end of June. By the end of June. So maybe talk a little bit about how, how do you, so if you have all those people, like how, are, how many resumes are you collecting? How many people are you vetting? You know, how is this happening behind the scenes to actually <laughs> place that many people in office and be prepared for the challenges of some dropping out, some not being, you know, able to move forward because mm -hmm. of other reasons? I mean, what happens under the hood on the staffing side? So open it there. Well, well, what we did was we took those 4,000 presidential appointments and we just simply tried to break them into meaningful buckets because you're not going to do all 4,000. And we didn't think that all 4,000 of them really mattered in the first you know, 200 days of an administration. And so we just simply stratified them and tiered them. Obviously, we're all very familiar with the cabinet appointments and we can sort of rattle off the top of our head which president appointed who to their cabinet. But then when you get inside the departments and agencies, there's some players that really make this <clears throat> engine work. And so I was responsible for the department and agency reviews. And one of the tasks that we gave each of our department and agency review teams were to identify the most significant appointments in that department or agency that would be presidential appointments and then those that would require Senate confirmation and then each of those teams were tasked to develop a list of five candidates for each of those positions that a president-elect could then use to 
inform their appointments. And so we had cleared, you know, well over 5,000 people because you take those most significant appointments and like 960 of them require Senate confirmation and you try to get a short list of five for all 960 of those positions and then you try to work them through the security clearance and work them through, unfortunately, the Office of Personnel Management for those of us who might have had our data at the Office of Personnel Management at the time that it got hacked. Uh, we may not be particularly happy with how aggressive we were in our preparation, but we actually thought it was smart because you could get the ball way down the field and you could actually start working to try to move through that Senate confirmation process. But the scale of the activity of identifying 5,000 potential and then getting them security cleared and getting them ready to be considered by a president-elect for potential appointments is no small task. And you don't well, want to try to pull that off, I don't think, the day after the election. You actually want, on the day after the election, to appoint your chief of staff, to have your nominee for the head of OMB and do what you know, President Reagan did with Jim Baker and with David Stockton so that when you bring that potential new cabinet appointee in, you have you know, a pretty good business conversation with them. And that's what I think David Stockton and Jim Baker and Ronald Reagan did with their appointees so that the budget process doesn't become a food fight of everybody sort of fighting for capturing their share of the budget. Rather, you're informed in that process by the campaign promises the candidate has made and you then become the enabler of executing on those campaign promises. So you've just heard the model of how it should be done, and in part because of the work that the partnership has done in providing the funding the, or the office space and the leeway to do it properly beginning after the convention. So you heard me earlier say that we didn't start until after the election, actually. I was part of a small group of lawyers who were in charge of vetting the cabinet. There were four of us. We had all formed uh, back in April to f vet the vice presidency. And the vice presidency, we did perfectly. There were four of us. We were holed up in a, in a Washington law firm. We weren't allowed to talk about our work. I spent two months just working on Al Gore, whom I'd worked for in 1988. I knew Al Gore as well as I knew my own father. Uh, I provided literally dozens of memos and position papers and material for the governor on Al Gore as a choice. It was a successful choice, so they reprised the team after, right after the election. We, we, got down to, uh, we got to Washington, where we were headquartered. The governor was based in Little Rock, so you had two competing power centers right off the bat. The governor wanted to start with the cabinet. He wanted a cabinet that looked like America, and he wanted a cabinet-centric government because he was the governor of a small state. He was used to running the state through agencies. He didn't have a large personal staff. So the White House staff to him wasn't going to be the driver of policy. It was going to be the cabinet. So he made, the t I think, one of the seminal mistakes, and Max can talk about it in a more historical context, of focusing just on the cabinet for the first, literally the first two months of a 70-day process. And so what we were getting were, were just lists that were being faxed of, OK, for Secretary of Transportation, we need an Hispanic, we need a woman, we need a black, we need a couple of white males, a couple of white females. It was all done by demographics, because he wanted a cabinet that looked like America. And so the list kept changing, because A, Governor Clinton knew more people than anybody, perhaps, in America. He had friends everywhere. And as he put names on, other names were recommended, then people were coming in and erasing names. So that list was constantly evolving. We didn't actually get a final list until, you know, say, three weeks after that, that list process began. And we were vetting names furiously. And you can't vet 40 names for a single cabinet position and do it properly, as well as get the paperwork done, as well as start the FBI process. So that cabinet process dragged on through Christmas, literally through Christmas. And we made terrible mistakes because we didn't set standards for what would be acceptable conduct, what wouldn't be. You saw that played out with Zoe Baird, for those of you who remember that those days. You know, she had a nanny problem. We had some really smart people in Washington who were saying, 
You cannot get her through the Senate Judiciary Committee with that problem. But you had, you were, you had, had a candidate who had run against Washington. He didn't, he didn't want to rely on Washington. He didn't have a lot of old Washington hands other than Vernon Jordan and Warren Christopher. He had run against it. So there was a sense of us versus them. And if them said she's not acceptable, the us said, well, we're going to go with it anyway. And it you know, created a huge problem for him perceptually in terms of getting his team in place. And so uh, the second problem he made, to your earlier point, is he did not focus on his White House staff until frankly, after his cabinet was done. He named a chief of staff at the beginning of December, Mac McCarty. He was not entrusted to then come up with a strong White House staff. That was given to somebody else, if you can imagine that. And uh, so the White House staff wasn't formed until actually right up to the week of the inauguration. So I think Max would tell you that you cannot run those two processes separately, and you cannot start with the cabinet at the expense of the White House. And I think what's interesting about both of your experiences, both of your candidates were running against incumbents. And it really strikes me the need, Max, maybe to have a nonpartisan independent push on this, because I can't imagine you were, as you were building this infrastructure, you probably didn't have a ton of interaction with the existing government and the existing agencies to do assessments and to review what they were working on and have the benefit of, of that analysis, right? So. The way we were informing our department and agency yeah. reviews, well, first of all, Max facilitated the very first meeting, and we did have representatives of the Obama administration and then Governor Levitt and myself and Chris Liddell in that first meeting up on the Hudson, and we came together for one day, and we just simply listened to what the Obama administration had done. We listened to Max, and we listened to what Bush 43 had done. And then we kind of departed. And that was, that was in April. And that was the last real touch of substance that we had with the, um, with the Obama administration. We were ready. Uh, two days after the election, I had planned a meeting for the leaders of um, all of my department and agency review teams. And we had worked through the administration. And they had been completely cooperative. And we were ready to have our team that was going to review HHS, we were ready for them to go in the week after the election. And so we'd done that brokering to set up the meeting, which never occurred. And we had reserved the space where I was going to fill a room of you know 400 people that were going to do my department and agency reviews as we gave them their, quote, training and their instructions and the way in which we were actually going to go in, which, again, we didn't have the privilege of doing, but we were ready. Uh, sending the note canceling that meeting wasn't the, my favorite activity in 2012, <laughs> but, um, but we were ready. But you don't have, in the planning phase, you don't have access to, nor would it be even appropriate for you to, in my view, you don't have access to, you know, pick your favorite department or agency. But what you have on your team are people who have previously worked in that department or agency. And the way that we composed our teams, and at least the way that I was building my teams out for the department and agency reviews, I wanted a combination of fresh eyes, so people like me who spent my adult life in New York, who spent my adult life at Deloitte, who spent my adult life in the private sector, and then experienced hands, people like Governor Levitt, who had headed to, had been in Bush 43's cabinet as the head of um, HHS and then also as the head of the EPA. And so as we composed all of those teams, we actually had a mix of, again, fresh eyes, a new perspective, let's bring some new ideas, experienced hands, people who actually know where the bathroom in HHS is located. And they actually know something about how HHS runs and what do those 70,000 people do. And so as we were preparing our 200-day plan and then lining that 200-day plan up with the campaign commitments that had been made by the candidate, what is it that we were going to do in each of those major platforms the candidate had campaigned on in each of those department and agencies to enable bringing those promises to reality? And that's what our 200-day plan was all about. I, one of the, as I listened to Gary, one of the 
one of the things that was interesting as I had the privilege of planning and just meeting with lots of people during that six months that I was working on this readiness project, I remember one of the guys, and I'm sure that as my late mother would say, this is the art of exaggeration to make a point, but what he said to me was, the president-elect and the president will actually accomplish more on his first day than he will in his first week. And the president will accomplish more in his first week than he will in his first month. And the president will accomplish more in his first month than he will in his first year. And just and I think it was a little bit of reflecting on, and if you, we all sort of have our mental image of Jim Baker, Ronald Reagan, David Stockton, calling in those appoint, appointees. And Reagan reset the cost of government. But he reset the cost of government in those very first early days and what he did in those early days. And that's what we were, why we were moving with such a sense of urgency is we wanted to enable a momentum creating first, you know, 200 days. That's why we built those 200 day plans. Who knows, it might have all been, you know, for naught, but it's also possible it was going to be very enabling with a business leader being elected as president who's been a private equity guy who actually knows how to acquire a company, develop a plan, and then successfully drive that. That's what we were trying to get ourselves ready to do, but we were trying to link the campaign promises directly to the planned actions that were going to happen inside the department and agency. And then just to go back, not only was our language readiness trying to avoid the word transition because we didn't want to see a story on the front page of the Washington Post about what was happening over in the Switzer building, uh, we also just were brutally aggressive in writing charters for each of our department and agency reviews so that we didn't have the risk, for those of you in professional services and, and project management, we didn't want scope creep. We wanted to be able to hold the department and agency review teams aggressively to a charter. So they weren't going to become a policy voice and trying to influence policy or develop policy. They were charged with, this is how the candidate campaigned, and this is the promises the candidate made. You're about what is it that needs to happen in those department and agencies to bring that to life? And we were aggressive that our readiness team in Washington, we wanted out of the media. We never responded to one media inquiry, and we tried to make sure that everything that was happening about the campaign was coming out of Boston. Nothing was coming out of Washington where our readiness team was. So Max, let's, let's talk about specifics from the partnerships perspective. How do you view success? Like in the, as we roll into 2016, what are the top priorities you think that you need to accomplish either through your own interactions with all the campaigns or legislatively? What, what, what will make you happy that this process was successful? Okay, I think we got a, a request for questions. Or, okay, yeah, I, and, and again, I love the question. Um, and success is pretty straightforward, and that is that we have whoever our next president that they're actually ready on day one to run the full federal government. And that means that they have their leadership team in place, that they actually understand how to operate the government effectively, they have a management agenda, uh, and they're looking at the government in a way um, that will enable it to perform at a whole different level. I mean, we largely have legacy organizations in the federal government that there is not a really uh, committed group inside that can effectively change how it operates. The transition is enormously disruptive, so you think about your own businesses if your leadership group got wiped out uh, every four years, and it is every four years even if someone is reelected because there's a pretty complete changeover certainly at the very top. Um, and you think about this, the scale of those number of people, 4,000 people, um, what that also does for the career workforce is it keeps them really at arm's length from a lot of the you know, critical leadership and management sense of responsibility. But success would be an understanding of whoever comes in next that they need to get their team in place. If they're going to be effective, they have to be ready at day one. Running the government is an incredibly difficult process. It only gets worse uh, as time goes on. You get into a posture of being reactive to world events. If you're going to make change, it has to be at the very front end. So we're trying to help people get their team in place, have a different vision about how to manage the government effectively, re-examine some critical aspects about how the government runs like the center of government and, and how it operates with the different agencies, a point that Gary was making. And then fundamentally, um, executing the policy promises that 
that have been made in a, in a much, much clearer way. And for everybody here, and I'm really interested in the questions that folks might have, I mean, you know, government touches you in all kinds of ways. And what's fascinating to me is, by and large, business does not engage with government on the managerial and operational things that you all do so well. The way in which uh, the business community, and frankly, everyone else engages with government is around their policy preferences. And that's a mistake because, again, the idea is meaningful, but if you can't get it done, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. And if you have to deal with uncertainty or poor decision making, fragmented decision making, that hurts everybody. So there is a phenomenal opportunity here. You've heard two different stories about approaches. It's, again, a Groundhog Day exercise. The people who have this information have been individuals rather than actually you know, uh, systematized uh, uh, data for them to use, and that's what we're changing in our Ready to Govern program. That's we right. help the Romney team. We look forward to helping the next folks uh, even more so. Where were you in 92? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in 92. In 92, <laughs> I was working for you. <laughs> doing I found you know Max, I like found the, Max the, Steyer the, as there a we go. young law student at Stanford Law there we School. Go. Did advance, exactly. <laughs> so you think you have questions that you wanted to? No? no? Okay. Oh, oh I see. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to do so a couple said, more, yeah. and then we're going to open it up to the audience to give me two more uh, seconds here. So let's talk about attracting talent. Um, Jim alluded to the hacking of people's personal data, your fingerprints. Um, it is a, a hyper intense environment with the media, with partisanship. Um, how hard is it to attract people, especially from the private sector, to now step forward and want to serve and, and deal with the, the kind of, I don't want to say nonsense, but these kind of other uh, factors that come into play. I mean, and, and you know, you, you did it a while ago, but yeah, well, you I, might be in place to have a role moving forward. I think it's think getting this. increasingly harder yeah. to attract real talent. I mean, I think if you're coming out of a business today and you have, you're fortunate to have relatively complex finances, you've been in public, you've spoken, you've articulated positions, uh, and you're, let's say, not straight in the middle, but you, you're on one side of the spectrum, I think, and, you have, and you're hoping for a Senate-confirmed job, I think the, the, the task is daunting mm -hmm. to see a, a smooth process to confirmation. And I think for those who aren't firmly, firmly committed to a job specific, to, a, to wanting to do something you know, very concrete for the federal government. It's a, it's a, a dream that becomes increasingly uh, nightmare. <laughs> a nut, yeah, it becomes a nightmare. I think it's very, very hard. And I talk to a lot of my friends who are like me, who served 25 years ago, who would like to go back down uh, in the next uh, for the next president. And um, yeah, you, know, you see so many. You see more obstacles than you see opportunities. And I think that's a real shame of the process. Gary is right, but I also think that, you know, think Obama had 300,000 resumes that were sent to him. And a lot of the damage that's done in terms of making the process difficult is, is self-inflicted. And so if you look at the Obama administration, they made a choice of not taking lobbyists. You know, Gary raised the uh, Zoe Baird example, which is a terrific one. Um, my understanding is the Bush administration, after the Zoe Baird incident, had asked the question, have you paid your nanny taxes? And they chose a rule that said you can cure it, write the check, and then you're going to be fine to actually serve. Yeah. The Obama administration came in. They didn't even know, and this is about the process we're trying to change, they didn't know what the choices were that the Bush administration made. So they, you know, uh, you know from, from, from you know, start for, without understanding what the Bush folks did, said, no, if you haven't paid your nanny taxes, you can't serve. So, but Max, yeah. but, but, but there's now a, a legislation that's going through that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been told that if you work for a company and you want to then go down to Washington, your company cannot give you any kind of severance package or any kind of going away gift that you would otherwise be entitled to if you're going into the federal government. Uh, that would be news to me. There may be some legislation that's been proposed. I don't think anything has been passed. By and large, again, the, you know, there, there are multiple problems, right? But by and large, it's the, uh, the, you know, the administration itself that proposes or accepts rules that are, um, they don't understand the unintended consequences, and they cause themselves more harm than, than is actually necessary. Yeah. It's also true that's by and large only a real problem for those 1,000 people that have to go through Senate confirmation. We were helpful, and, and actually the Romney team was very helpful in getting legislation passed that reduced the number of Senate-confirmed positions by about 170, so about 10% of them. Right. We want to take another whack at that. This is a broken system. Part of the reason why it's broken is people haven't been focused on it, mm -hmm. and so it's all an inside game. And that's, again, why we're doing this, is we want people here to say, hey, it doesn't have to be this way, and we can change it, because there's some pretty easy, simple fixes uh, that are possible. You can get, I think, your, your, your key leadership team 
That's the top four to 500 people in by the August recess. Nobody has ever actually, who's, who's been uh, elected, has set that as a goal. And that would be one of the things that we propose when you ask about right. success. So no question, Gary's right. Things have been made too difficult. Things get caught up in the politics of it. Part of our theory is going fast is actually easier than going slow because you have momentum at the front end in which individual senators are going to be unwilling at that point to stand up and get in the way, whereas not very far down the line, they're willing to do that. So again, it's a, it's, it's a very uh, problematic system that has huge consequences for us. Even if we don't get the full loaf, if we get half a loaf, we'll have made a big, big change. That's good. That's good. Excellent. OK, I think we'll, uh, we'll open it up to the audience, please. Yes. Uh, a staff of 500 is significant. How did you cover those costs? And I have one other question is, how many political, uh, how many Senate confirmed positions are there now? I heard 100, I heard 960, so I just wanted to clarify that. I think that. it's 1,100 Senate, or 1,000 or something. Well, but the Max is best here, but the 970, I think, is the right number. It's about, it's about 1,000, so yes, yes, yes. But it used to be 1,200. It, it used to be more. It used, oh. we used to have another 160 that, that we were able to remove. But you have the first front end of your question, Jim, about paying for it. Volunteers, that what I received as a product of working on this was, <laughs> and you know, I used to work for money, but... Uh, <laughs> But we did have some people who weren't former CEOs on the team that we actually did make a modest stipend to, but it was modest, very modest. And, and so the more, the, and it, yeah. The, the actual money, the actual money from the federal budget that comes to this process is under a million dollars. Okay. And when do you get that? When does that come in? After, after, the, uh, nom after the nomination, after the, when you've completed, when you're through your convention and you have a nominee, then you actually get this really modest number. And so prior to that, what we did is we raised, we raised the money. And so we asked people like me to write modest checks. And then when we rolled those modest checks up, we got to four or five million dollars. And then we just hustled up some space in Washington. And then after the nomination, we moved into the Switzer building, and the government provided the space for us uh, after the convention and after we had a candidate. So yeah, just to, to follow up on that, so the space, the computer systems, and this is quite important because, again, there were you know, some uh, interesting allegations that you know, the Obama transition uh, process had been infiltrated by the Chinese. They did not have a secure computer system. So the notion here in the legislation we got passed actually gives government space, computer systems, and, and all the infrastructure to the candidates three days after the, the conventions. And the primary purpose in our, in, our, in our proposing this as legislation was, again, to change the presumption so that you know, preparing pre-election was viewed as something that Congress actually wanted you to do rather than creating this big political risk. On the financial side, it's, a, it's an interesting question. The size of the teams are growing a lot. They need to in order to be able to achieve the readiness uh, that Jim is describing. But that money then has to be largely raised uh, by the, the candidate in the campaigns. It's small relative to the, the full amount of money that, that is being uh, you know, uh, deployed in the campaign. But it is consequential. And you've got questions about access and all that sort of stuff, too. But it's a, it's a better world that we live in that actually candidates begin to prepare. And, and I'm willing to take that, that kind of uh, you know, downside. I would also want to just emphasize one point, and that is uh, the Obama administration through GSA could not have been more cooperative, more supportive, more helpful. And we had a leader in GSA who organized the Switzer building for us, had organized the space for me at the Department of Ed where we were going to have this meeting. Max was going to be one of our speakers immediately after the election was our plan. But GSA and the Obama administration were <clears throat> perfectly professional and 100% cooperative with us. I don't think it was even, I don't think so. I'm sorry. 
I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not technology has facilitated or encumbered the transition process. You know, we have LinkedIn now, you can, you know, the, the, here you're getting paper resumes, you know, probably makes a 20 year old go, oh my God. Um, you know, Gary was getting faxes. Yeah, <laughs> even faxes. Well, we, were, we, were, we were, you know, it was antiquated when I think about it. I mean, we were getting, you know, these slow fax machines and everything was done by paper, everything. I mean, we, we didn't really have, we didn't have Google, we didn't have, when we did vetting, we were doing vetting by going to microfiche, basically. Can you imagine that? We used the technology platforms that were available to enable the work that we were seeking to achieve. But I think your, your point is a really important one, and that is that technology has obviously been uh, a revolutionary force in probably all of your businesses, and not as much as it needs to be in government more generally. And part, of, again, of our proposition is the transition is an opportunity to rethink the way government operates. You truly cannot re-engineer the airplane as you're flying it. It is an incredibly difficult proposition when you're a president or running an agency to believe that you're going to not only handle all the incoming, but also rethink how you actually do business. And so our notion is now is actually a time to be thinking about that. Now is to, to reimagine how the center of government operates, how we use technology, you know, how we manage more effectively in the world that we're in today, and then have the transition folks prepare to, 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 to be able to implement those kind of changes as they come in. Um, because otherwise, you're not going to see the kind of transformation that we ultimately need in government. So from our end, this is that the broader proposition here is about how do we actually make government a more effective implementer of the kinds of things that we want and need. And it isn't easy to do that because it's insulated in many ways from the same kind of pressures that you are. The transition is the starting point and the, the fulcrum from which a lot of that stuff can happen. That's our theory of the case and why we're pushing as hard as we are on this. We, we just manage the presidential appointments the same way that you do succession planning in your businesses. I mean, when my department and agency teams handed that short list of five for each of those positions, then it was hands off and there was separate security. You, you couldn't even get into the room where the people that were doing the clearing Jeez. was going on. It's amazing. <laughs> and, we did it all. <laughs> well, we just didn't want in the public domain, here are the five names that have been recommended for the treasury secretary. And the way that you make sure that doesn't get in the public domain is the number of people who actually know who's on that short list of five. And frankly, Governor Romney might have rejected all five of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, who knows? But yeah. from our process, we were very aggressive in trying to protect the security of the presidential appointments. So who was going to be the chief of staff? I mean, I happen to have my view of that, but frankly, it didn't matter. The guy that was going to decide that was Governor Romney. I don't know what he would have decided. I think I know. But we were aggressive in trying to maintain security, but we didn't go so far as not to use the tools available to us today in the way that we do business today. And then I just want to emphasize one point. Gary had the privilege of doing something we didn't, so he actually got appointments and he got that stuff through. I know that there were people I wanted on my short list that I couldn't get to a yes. I mean, I had one guy that I really wanted as the head of OMB, and I said, can I get your name on the short list? Would you be willing to do this? And I couldn't get him to a yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I temper that with uh, being very pleasantly surprised. I, I had no earthly idea that there were, the, there were these 4,000 appointments, and I had no earthly idea there are 12 to 16,000 people in the orbit in Washington just dying for the privilege of getting back into government again, some of whom are enormously able and enormously talented. Yeah. So you, you have the most available and you have the most qualified, your view, can you get the most qualified to a yes? Not every time. Right. Mm -hmm. And it isn't yeah. because people are worried about the mechanics, it's because people are worried about the atmosphere, and they're not sure they want to be part of that. Sure. Ron? 
What is the impact on the process, if any, if the president-elect is of the same party as the uh, outgoing president? So, I mean, the history on that is that it's a, it's a lot less than people anticipate. Um, so, you know, the, the most recent example was uh, you know, President Bush succeeding President Reagan, and there were a lot of people in the Reagan administration who thought this would be very smooth, that they would stick around, whatever it might be, and the answer was not. Uh, and there was, you know, full turnover of everybody. Uh, so in many ways, you know, party to uh, same party may be uh, even more disruptive because expectations are that it will be less. Um, it, the, the norms are that people, you know, it, it, it comes back to Jim's point, as difficult as it is to get through the process, as poisonous as the climate is, there's still an awful lot of folks that would like to have these jobs and for good reason. I mean. There may be some bad reason, but there's a lot of good reason because it's an opportunity to serve at a scale that is unparalleled in any other possible uh, venue. Um, you, you're playing on the biggest stage uh, for the American people. So um, by and large, you see you know, quite a bit of, of, of turnover. Um, it's also fascinating that uh, the handoff is even same party, same party, typically um, not well thought through. And so one of the areas we're focused on is not simply on preparing the, the campaigns to know how to do transitioning in right, but trying to help uh, governments transition out effectively as well. Um, the Bush administration and Josh Bolton, the, the President Bush's White House Chief of Staff, wanted to make the transition out the best that had ever been before, and for good reason, because we were living and currently live in a different world in which transitions are also a point of substantial vulnerability from a national security perspective. And they did a lot to help the Obama folks. Um, but it's still the case, every agency wound up doing its own thing. There was no template. Um, so that's something we're trying to change. We're trying to actually systematize the outgoing process in the same way as we're trying to systematize the incoming. But by and large, it's been ugly on both sides all the time, no matter what. So, so if, if theoretically, the easiest transition would be incoming for the same party as the outgoing, the worst would be <laughs> different parties where the incoming actually defeated the outgoing, which is what we had. And that creates a whole set of issues that, you know, and to Max's point, everybody leaves. They leave as quickly as they can. So when you come into an agency as we did, and I'll use, I'll use justice as the example, so we didn't have an attorney general. We didn't have an attorney general until March. I think it was actually maybe even, Janet Reno was named after two other people had gone by the wayside. So we had, and, and remember, the Democrats had not been in power for 12 years. So we had people from the Carter administration who had some kind of tangential understanding of justice in Justice Department basically running it for, I think, more than 60 days with no support from any of the political, you know, they had all left. So it was a bureaucracy that was running. And the bureaucracy, as you discover, and Max and I served together in the Justice Department, is really good really good and under, I think, underrated by the political appointees who come in. Um, but just one other quick point on, on what happens when you have an outgoing uh, and incoming. Uh, with the Clinton administration, they had very little relationship with, uh, with the Bush administration that was leaving. And just to, to illustrate that point, I was telling Max this earlier, I saw that Sandy Berger goes over with Tony Lake to talk to, um, I think it was Scowcroft about foreign policy. And in the midst of a conversation in the middle of December, Scowcroft says, oh, by the way, we're going to send in some troops to Somalia today. Says, what? Says, yeah, we're putting some troops in. Don't worry about it. We're going to clear the ports, and it won't be an issue. They don't tell the pres president-elect. They don't tell the vice president-elect. They eventually tell them that after the troops are on their way. Those troops then became the source of Black Hawk Down and the president's first foreign policy crisis in 1993. But there was no coordination. There was no discussion of, is this something that you would want? Is there, there was no coordination because of that inherent tension between you know, the defeated, the vanquished, and the, and the conqueror. So it creates its own inherent problems. Thank you. Um, it sounds like the 70 days isn't enough time and if this problem is well enough known in Washington relative to transitions, readiness, whatever you want to call it, is there any thought to maybe changing Inauguration Day to a different date? I don't think that really solves the problem because the longer period you have, the 
more you know, question you have about the legitimacy of the choices that the, uh, you know, the current president, who you know, is, is no longer the, you know, has the will of the people behind him or her, has. So I think the answer isn't so much to extend the back end of the runway as to increase the runway on the front side. And that's our theory of approach. And I think you can do that. I think you know, Jim and, and, and his colleagues demonstrated that that is really possible. Um, uh, and our view, again, is uh, we, you know, we need to take a, 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 a multi-cycle uh, view of this so that you know, what Jim was able to do, and again, we, we helped you know, connect him with some relationships, the head of GSA and all those sorts of stuff. Now that, to me, is the foundation. And we have the opportunity to build on top of that and get better and better. And our goal is to create this learning system um, that will enable this process to catch up to where it actually needs to be. And we have a, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in order to make that happen. But basically, I'd be very leery of trying to, trying to push the other date back, because I think you run into some substantial issues more akin to what Gary is describing about choices being made that don't really have the political support uh, of the public behind them. Uh, sir. Yeah, you. <laughs> of the legislation and to the extent that, does the legislation require what the readiness team is doing or the transition team is doing to make anything public? And I, I heard that you couldn't, you, you didn't want to make it public and I understand that, but then I also think there might be a reason to make it public with regard to the election. As you get closer to November, is there anything that would be made public from the readiness team to help in the election? I, I think the answer is no. The campaign, the candidate needs to get elected and have Governor Levitt become very proactive and very communicative about what the readiness team was doing. Yeah. That wasn't going to help the candidate yeah, get elected. That's right. And it had the potential because everyone just simply likes to run to a story and try to find an issue and then try to make an issue that the candidate then has to respond to. What we didn't want is our candidate responding to anything that was going on with respect to our team. And I think we were absolutely correct in moving that way. We, three of us went from Washington to Boston, you know, every week for a, we would we'd start in Boston on, and, th and then we got to every other week, but we'd spend three hours there. But had we been brutally transparent on how we were progressing all we would have been doing is just creating noise that the campaign would have had to respond to, and it wouldn't have contributed to them getting elected. So I'd like to make a, personal a friendly amendment to this. So our goal, you asked the question about the legislation. The legislation doesn't require that anything be made public. What we are trying to still do and did with the legislation is to tra change the expectation so that, again, the historical rule had been transition planning pre-election was viewed as a substantial political vulnerability. And what we wanted to do, back to the issue, sort of the, the metaphor of the runway, is to change that so folks like you know, uh, Governor Romney would take a different tack and would begin preparing earlier and aggressively, and that's what, they, that, that's what was done. Um, I believe that the next stage for us is to actually have the American public and critical stakeholders like all of you begin to ask questions of the candidates um, about what they are actually doing to be ready to govern if they have uh, the, the great uh, honor of being elected. And I think that ought to be actually a campaign issue because uh, the reality is that what we all get when we elect somebody is going to be defined in large measure by their ability to actually be able to be ready to govern on day one. And so um, if you look at the public opinion polling today, uh, unlike uh, the historical um, record, the public is very concerned about whether government is actually providing the services in an effective way that they want. And it could be because of the rollout of healthcare.gov, it could be because of the veterans uh, you know, administration activities, it could be because of the Secret Service, a bunch of stories where government organizations have not, um, not met uh, you know, the expectations of the public. What we would like to see at the partnership is that the uh, translation of that um, unhappiness is a expectation on the candidates that they're going to actually have the ability and the focus on being effective leaders and managers of the government. So that they're not making simple promises, but they're making promises they can actually execute on. So mine is a little different answer. 
it shouldn't be the case that transition teams are sharing what candidate they're thinking about for different jobs, but I think it's a legitimate and important question for the media, for business, and for others to be asking the candidates, what are you doing to be ready to govern? If you win, will you be ready to win? What is this? It's not the brass ring. It's actually running the government. The movie uh, Robert Redford says now after he gets elected, now what? You don't <laughs> want that. You don't want someone uh, running our government who is in that position. And that has been a historical norm, you know, going back to Clinton, whatever. And we haven't talked about Obama, but there were some real issues there with respect to this as well. So, you know, part of my plea to all of you is to begin asking that question. Are you doing what you need to do to be ready to govern if you win? And do you have the skills and capabilities to do that right? That, to me, is entirely legitimate. It ought to be asked. And if we don't ask that question, we're not really focusing on a really important issue about the future of our country. I did present one time oh, okay. at a big Republican event oh, what we were doing. And Governor yeah. Levitt did that a number of times to answer the question of, well, Mitt, are you ready? And what are you doing to get ready? And so Governor Levitt was very articulate in communicating. And so that was done in friendly circles. It wasn't done in public setting. But we were transparent in that regard to be clear that we had 500 people in Washington doing all the work that I referred to and summarized in this book. This is pathbreaking activity. We still have more pathbreaking to do, in my view. Yeah, you've got to set the environment. Yep. I mean, before Jim can talk about it, the public has to be you know, acclimated to believe that this is a really legitimate campaign issue. It's not yet. And that's what we want. That's what we want from all of you. So. And doing this is not untoward. This is right. actually right. a good it's thing. It's not to do presumptuous. This. It's actually smart. Right. Right. Uh, Nancy. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask of all three of you, how confident are you that the current candidates, both parties, all parties, are aware of this and potentially have that in their pipe or smoking it once they get elected? I have no visibility. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would say that it, you know, we're, we're not there yet. I mean, I think that, again, um, what the Romney uh, Readiness Project did was new. Uh, and it is, now, it is not yet uh, accepted practice, but that's where we need to get to. And I, I would say that the campaigns are at different stages of maturity in thinking about these kinds of issues. Yeah. But from our perspective, um, you know, our goal, you know, as a, we're a non-profit, non-partisan organization, uh, our goal is to get all the candidates to understand that basically if they haven't set their transition uh, leader by the time of the, you know, the first week of April, they ain't going to be ready. And, and they should be judged yeah. critically by the American public if they haven't done that. I, I would say just to answer your question, the one who's probably the most likely to get this right, ironically, is Hillary Clinton because she's gone through it. She's gone through it twice, and her chairman, John Podesta, was the yeah, chair yeah, of the Obama, the Obama transition. So, so she'll have the, as opposed to her husband in 92 who had no institutional knowledge of how to do it because they had been out of, you know, hadn't done it in 16 years, she will have the personnel, she'll have the, the playbook, she'll have the mistakes to and, and get I, right. And, I, and, I, and again, it's hard, hard to handicap this, but one thing I would say is it's a different world we're in today. And so what's really important is whoever's done it before better not believe that that was the right way to do it. They got to rethink it again um, for yeah. all the reasons, like the technology reasons, the legislative changes. Um, and so that's part of the challenge here is to understand we, in transition as in everything else, we got to get better and better. And there are new opportunities to do that. But we were very transparent by publishing this book. Yes. And there are many, many, many people in Washington who understand government and have worked in departments and agencies who know what was done. And we were overt about wanting that as a commitment to our country. And we have one president at a time. Right. And we need that one president to be a, an enormous success and start yes. with real momentum. That's what we believed, and that's what we were trying to enable when we chose to try to document the approach that we had followed. And it wasn't because we think, you know, this is. This is, this is how you do it, and there's only one way to do it. I, I don't believe that even for a minute. But this is what we did, right. and you have a sense of what President Clinton did, and what I think the next president will do is they'll take what we did and they'll take it to the next level. That's my hope, 
And that's what that's Max right. and his organization are trying to enable. And I, I actually think that we're going to do that. Yep. That's right. Because that's what I would love to see is the next president start where we ended, not start where we started. Right. And so you're going to be able to take that next step. And I believe that will happen. I, the optimist in me says that's going to happen. Romney Readiness Project, 2012, and, and then it's uh, Chris Liddell and Daniel Cruz were the guys that did the hard work to assemble, um, assemble the, the summary. Great. We're going to take one more question uh, first, and then we'll wrap it. I'd like to take this to a different direction. We all know the expression, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. Talk to us about the psychological transition from going from president-elect to president, when all of a sudden you realize what it means to have won. <laughs> well, it's, a, you know, it's the most exciting thing in the world, right, to work on something. I worked on it from January of 92 to November. And, and, but you're so, I mean, we were so uh, mired in the minutia of getting this cabinet through the process. And we were, we were creating, we were a bunch of kids. I mean, we were all kids. Everyone was kids. That was what was so interesting about our process. And none of us had ever experienced what, you know, we had all been in the wilderness from the age of 18 on. So it was an elusive idea for so long. And suddenly it's there, but you can't even focus on what it's going to be like to govern, to get a job, because we were so transfixed about just getting the job done. Ultimately, when you get into the White House, you know, I was, I was there in 93. You know, it's one of the great thrills of, of you know, if you're, I was 30 years old. I was a lawyer, and I was working in a Wall Street law firm a year earlier, and suddenly I'm working in the White House, and there's, you know, nothing more exciting about that. But when you're in the transition, you just, I mean, it may be different today. We just didn't have time to let it, let it, I guess, seep in. It was just, it was so frenetic to get the process going and through. And, and I would just to, to underscore what Gary said, I think the overwhelming uh, amount of incoming is, is, is just, it's, it, it, it really is so disruptive, and which again is why the planning is so important. Because if you haven't planned, you, you're just not going to be able to do it in the moment. And there is way, way more than, as bad as campaigns are, where you always are under-resourced against the, the, the need that you have, the government environment is phenomenally challenging. And you see that not, I mean, again, I, I have some familiarity, but not an enormous amount at the, for, the, for the president, but much more so for the leaders of you know, cabinet agencies, et cetera. The tyranny of the, of the, of the urgent is, is overwhelming, and the important yeah, gets lost. Yeah, that's good, exactly. And uh, the you know, tyranny it's, of the it, to me, it's just, that's why it's all about the planning. And it's, it's, it's why it's so important to understand the leverage of the large organization that ultimately the yeah. president runs. And I think right. that is often lost. Right. We had. I mean, we yeah. had. We were at, literally. We were. We got the Bush documents of what they had given their their uh, their potential nominees of questions they wanted to ask, and there were gaping holes. And so we sit down and we're like, "Well, this isn't going to cover. This isn't going to cover it." So we just started writing our own questions, and then suddenly the FBI says, "Well, we, now there's a 302. You've got to." We didn't know anything about how to what the process was, how to do it, and we were making it on the fly with no adult supervision. <laughs> and I look uh, back on it now, and it's just it's <laughs> mind-boggling. On your question about the emotion of winning, I can tell you about the other emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, promised, I also promised that I would be very even today. And I would make no other political comments about that. But, the, but then one serious comment I would make is we had a team that had focused on the first 24 hours of a president-elect. What was he going to do that first 24 hours? And we had another team that was, what's going to happen in the first 24 hours after January 21st? And who are the world leaders that you call? And in what order are you going to call them? And who are the, and so I really think that you just get, I, I, I don't know that you really have a chance to sort of smell the roses or pop the cork on the champagne, because I just think you're totally, totally, overtaken by, we've caught the bus. We've been chasing this bus, we've caught the bus. Now we have to drive the bus. 
And I just think that, you know, like, I don't know how long, Gary, were you in the, in the White House? Sorry, 93. I mean, were I went you to there justice. all four or did you stay all eight? No, I, was just, I, I stayed through the midterm in 94 and then I came back to New York. But just imagine what those, I, I don't know that you ever really have, a time, have time in those four years to actually lean back and smoke a cigar and reflect on it because I think you're just hustling. There's just more to do every day than you have calories to do. At least that's my view of what it would be like. I didn't have the privilege of that. I can tell you about the other emotion, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want to tell you about it. Yeah. You can come up to the stage and ask him afterwards. Uh, just to close it out, I think this has been an incredibly insightful, dynamic panel. Um, I just want to kind of toss it back to you. Max, what can we do to help? What, what can the business community be doing? You're going to be going out there and, and recruiting all the candidates and helping uh, set up training wheels. Uh, so everyone's focused on this, but what else is the call to action specifically? That we so can do? I think there are at least three things, and, and I can come up with more if you can come right over. But, but I mean, I, I alluded to one, which is look, we, we have to change the, you know, the expectation here. And the only way that's going to happen is if people like you begin to ask the question, not just you know, what's your position on X, but you know, what are you doing to prepare to run the government, and how are you going to do that effectively? And so I would ask all of you to begin, you use, use your networks, I mean, technology question, it's a phenomenal world in which a group like this, with your networks, actually has a lot of power in terms of changing the nature of the dialogue. Uh, so that would be one. Second would be, um, where else can we go to? Mm -hmm. I mean, Ken, and you've been phenomenal, and, and, and all of you in coming uh, this morning. You know, where else can we, we, can we, can we, can we reach out to folks that, that, that may be interested in this in an effective way and can help uh, spread that word? Um, second piece for us really is, there's a lot of activity. I mean, we're a small organization. Ken identified uh, David Eagles, who is sitting back there smiling for some reason, because he's got so much work to do. He's like, he's an amazing guy. <laughs> he's doing great stuff uh, in running this process. We also have John Gilbert, who's in front of him, uh, who runs our business strategy. And our goal is to create a business constituency for effective government. Mm -hmm. And we need help. And so if this is something that you know, strikes your fancy and you want to have a conversation with either of them about ways you might help us, that would be terrific. And uh, you know, lastly is, again, we're a struggling nonprofit. So you, got, you know what that means. You know, if we can, any, any assistance you can give us both in kind and the work, but also uh, resources, we need it. And uh, again, thank you very much for your help, and thank you very much thank for you. With your pleasure. Well, thank, thank you all so much, Jim, Gary, uh, Max. This has been a, a true honor for our chamber and a great way to, to wrap up the year. So and again, thank so we thank you for coming. And thank uh, our hosts, Felix and Sunita from MetLife. Thanks for the team for putting this together, Laura Motz, Michael, Saeed. And uh, again, uh, we really want to also thank at the end of our year our two partners, Patty, who is videotaping this from Edge City Design. She's great. She works with us all year long. And Jeffrey Holmes, our photographer. So we want to thank you for all your great work this year. Uh, again, enjoy the holiday season. And we'll see you in 2016.